that which was from the beginning, which we've heard, which we've seen with our eyes, which we've looked upon, have touched with our hands, concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest, we've seen it, we testify to it. We proclaim to you the eternal life, that which is with the Father, was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. I have preached that now over a number of weeks. The next verse says this, And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. So I'm going to talk a little bit this morning on the subject of joy. It is the Christmas season. I have asked the band to throw in a Christmassy song every worship time. They have politely told me to go and fly kite. Clearly, because it doesn't happen. There is something about an anticipation for Christmas time. Even as you get older, it's not exactly the same, hey? When you were small, the Christmas trees and the presents gave great hope. But maybe, I mean, my boys have given lists like, well, one of them has given a list like this. The other one says, I don't mind what I get. The other one says, I know exactly what I want. It's my boys. But when you get older, the magic is gone, isn't it? When you're older, what really counts is family, friendship, love, people, in your space. That's what we want. And it all hangs around the subject of joy. And so I'm going to read a story this morning and then preach about something. I actually preached at our equip a little while ago. And I'm going to emphasize this thing that our joy may be complete by looking at the very first miracle Jesus ever did, which is the same author, John, who writes here, writes a story to us in the beginning of the book of John. John chapter 2. So turn there if you, if you have a Bible. If you don't, follow up behind me, but it's always best to get your own Bible that you know where what we're talking about is found. Because one day you're going to have to look up a verse in the Bible at work and you can't look up and hope it's going to appear on a screen. It's going to appear in the book. And don't always trust your media while you haul out your cell phone because maybe that thing's going to have a dead battery one day when you need the scriptures. It happens, my boys are on holiday. Every morning, I'm up at five, I open my, my Bible, I've got a reading plan, I push my iPad to go on, it's dead. And by the time it's on enough to be able to tell me where I was yesterday, half an hour's gone. And I make all sorts of promises, my boys will never play with my iPad again, and then later on, it all starts again. John chapter 2. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. Why? Only because he was hanging with his mom. She was actually invited. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? <laughs> Husbands, when you sit around the table late this afternoon, because it's no evening service, and your wife says, I'm thirsty. Woman, <laughs> what has this to do with me? I dare you. Because <laughs> the next verse says, my hour has not yet come. I promise you, yours will. <laughs> Don't try it at home, people. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. Now if you know anything about Jewish purification rites, this story is not working. When the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and didn't know where it came from, although the servants had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. You've kept the good wine until now. If only they'd known it was washing up liquid. <laughs> this, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory. And his disciples believed in him. Sure. This is a slap for any religious person in this room today. 
Because I've read the books, Sipping Saints. Jesus turned water into grape juice, not wine. No, friends, it was wine, alcohol. How is it that the first miracle the Son of God does is provide heaps of booze for a party? <laughs> How we have to work through this because we need to understand what's going on right here. Those of you battling alcohol addiction, no, this can't be true. It is. He showed his glory by putting the party on. What is happening? So Jesus and his mother has been invited to a party in some other backwater part of Nazareth. An ancient Middle Eastern culture was such that weddings were important. Weddings were not important for the couple. Weddings were important for the community. Because in those days, a marriage, a healthy marriage, a strong marriage meant children, meant a stronger workforce for the village in terms of economics, security. The, 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 the communities were so wrapped up in each other that a strong family meant for a strong community. Marriage was about community, not just about yourselves. By the way, that hasn't changed. Marriage is never just about you and what works for you. It's about your benefit to the community, the people of God. All right. So in those days, because they were poor, very poor under Roman occupation, what would happen was a wedding was the high point in most people's lives. You went from poverty to being dressed in robes and a crown. Ever been to a Catholic wedding? They put a crown on the head. You, were, you had a crown on your head. You had beautiful garments. And for a whole week, seven days, you were celebrated. The village came out to celebrate you and your wedding. For that moment, it was that thing you lived for. You looked for it before when you were a kid until you got older. And in that week, the, the people of the village would, would feast you, but you had one responsibility. You had to supply the wine. Wine was important in those days. You could be sued if your wedding ran out of wine. The rabbis equ uh, equated wine with joy. So can you imagine the tragedy that's happening right here? Day two, they're obviously very poor. They've run out of wine. Jesus' mother reads the moment, as most mothers can. She reads the moment, and she says to her son, they've got no more wine. The implications are they're about to have a ruined reputation for life in their community. Jesus intervenes. What's the big deal? No one's dying. No one's possessed by demons. No one's starving. Jesus is being asked to keep a party going. Why would he use such supernatural power to bring a lot of wine to sustain wedding facilities, uh, festivities? Jesus is going to show us right from the outset of his ministry that when he comes into any scenario at all, the end result should be joy. Because a wedding feast with celebration results in joy. He's trying to show us that the manifestation of his glory is he redeems bad situations, turns them good, and the people rejoice. Bottom line, that's what this morning is about. Although we're all affected in different ways by ministry, there needs to be a fullness of joy. Every miracle that ever takes place when we encounter God, shall result in joy. Whether it's salvation, forgiveness, healing, provision, deliverance, pr uh, uh, protection, service, etc. Remember in the Gospels how many times someone was touched or healed by Jesus and it says they went away rejoicing. All ministry should be punctuated by joy. The Bible actually uses 400 instances of the word joy and rejoicing. It's a big issue in the Bible to rejoice. The emphasis is on those famous verses, Nehemiah 8, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Psalm 51, restore to me the joy of your salvation. Jen alluded to that psalm this morning. Joy and rejoicing are a special preoccupation in the Psalms. 80 references to rejoicing in the, in the Psalms alone. The Gospels has about 40 references. Joy is a byproduct of life with God. Joy isn't found by seeking it in itself. Joy is what results in your life when you are confronted with Jesus. That's why in the book of 1 John, that which we've tasted, felt, seen, I proclaim to you, I want you to know him like we do so that you can have joy. If you go and pursue joy, you're not going to find it. 
But if you pursue Him, the result will always be a joy that settles in your life. Different to happiness. Christmas, happiness for a lot of kids is 25th of July up until 8 o'clock till they've opened those presents and didn't get what they want. Then happiness goes, Phoosh. then it's depression, call the psychologist who's in Mauritius. My kid's upset. What do I do? Joy is something given deep inside by God. It is received with the gift of salvation. When you know you're saved, joy comes with God's presence. The Holy Spirit brings joy. Joy fills a person. Joy is associated with the inner workings of your heart. Proverbs 15 says, a cheerful look brings joy to the heart. Psalm 28 says, the heart can leap or throb or swell with joy. Isaiah 60. Psalm 126, our voices are filled with songs of joy. Isaiah 65, a joyful heart brings out song. And joy can often be manifested in shouting, emotion, singing. There are approximately two dozen references for each in the Bible. The Psalms resound with choruses and shouts and songs of joy. Joy is a big thing. Interestingly, Jesus is being pushed into this moment before he feels his time is ready. He says, woman, my time isn't now. So Jesus chooses a wedding to do his first ever great miracle. And his first ever great miracle is one in which no one is healed, no one is delivered, no one is set free. The only thing that happens is water is turned into wine and a party ensues. Why does Jesus choose that moment to reveal his glory? We're going to look at four reasons quickly. Bearing in mind the Christmas season is upon us. The first reason is because we are introduced to the master of the feast. You read here in verse 9, the master of the feast is essentially the master of ceremonies. It was, his, it was his job to call the people to celebrate and to call the people to make sure that the conditions for the celebration were in place. So all the master of ceremonies did was get everyone in the same room together and then make sure everything was in place for the wedding to operate. Same today, a master of ceremonies at a wedding is pretty involved doing those things. It's what a church meeting actually entails. We're supposed to bring the people together and create an environment where people can still meet with the Lord. His job was to turn the party great. This master of ceremonies, however, this master of the feast, can't help. He's in trouble along with the wedding party because there's no more wine. And in this moment, Jesus reveals himself to be the true master of the feast. He is saying there will be a feast in heaven one day. And I will show you that I'm going to call you together and I'm going to put everything in place for you to feast. I'm going to be the true master of the feast. I will put the conditions in place. Jesus is thinking death, suffering, resurrection from the dead. He's looking into his own future and declaring there will be a feast at the end of all times. I, through my actions, I'm going to call you together into a place and I will provide the conditions in which you can feast. He introduces himself to us as the master of the feast. Now you need to think of that for a moment because a feast is a happy, joyous occasion. I hate religiosity in all its forms. I don't often manifest my hatred of it, but I have it. That's why in this building there is nothing churchy. I've told you so many times, people have said to me, why is there no crosses? Why is there no scriptures? Why is there no this? Because this is a building. It's a nice one, but it's a building. It's not the church. You are. We are. The feast entails when the people of God meet with God. I'm telling you, there are some Christians who believe that to be happy is a sin. They believe you must be miserable. Have you ever looked at their faces? They're the ones who, when Tian does that little bit of rock and roll thing this morning. But when it slows down to that slow bit. I have not found a verse in the Bible that says fast is sin and slow is good. I haven't found it. But for some of you, you've got to understand, I need to be... Then you get in your car and play the biggest junk on the way home. Jesus says, I am the master of the feast. He's uncapping. He is looking forward to a wedding, a celebration with people full of joy who look to the master of the feast because he's called us together and he's provided the conditions for us to worship in freedom. He's not just the master. 
And that's what some of us think he is. God is a slave driver. He's hard. You drop it once, he smacks you. He is the master of the feast. He wants to celebrate. He calls himself a... Anyway, let's not get into it now. So not only is he the master of the feast, number one. Number two, he wants us to experience his father. The Bible uses sensory language about God and salvation. Psalm 34, I will bless the Lord at all times, not just when I feel like it. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Let them hear what? The boast coming out of my mouth. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let's exalt His name together. Exclamation mark. Lord, you reign on high is not an exclamation. We need to lift the tempo in this place. I'm telling you. The band can help us by choosing songs we can't sing. But can I remind you, they're simply there to put the conditions in place. It's up to us to magnify the Lord. I sought the Lord and He answered me. Delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to Him are radiant. Their faces are never ashamed. You got an unradiant face? Start looking. You're a bit bleak for Christmas. I don't have enough to buy all I want. So what? Start looking. This poor man cried. The Lord heard him, saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. He delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him have no lack. These people, listen, when David writes Psalm 34, they know God is good. He's saying, I want your knowledge of God to go from the cerebral to the experiential. David is saying, I want you to taste and see how good the Lord is. There are Christians who say, I know the Lord is good, but they're the most miserable sods on earth. He says, I want you to taste and see. It's up to you and I together to embrace Him, to feel Him, to know Him, to walk with Him, to open ourselves to Him. Some of us are quite conservative in our outlook, but the Bible gives us no choice. I'm telling you, when that last trumpet sounds and that feast happens, some of you are going to be shocked at the celebration. The Bible says God Himself rejoices over you with singing and dancing. Some of you can't even understand what that means. God literally does a staying alive move. That's what I didn't want to do this morning. God literally does that over you. He can't wait to be with you. Isaiah 25. Jesus must have been thinking about this. He's watching this wedding happen. Firstly, he shows them he's a master of the feast. Secondly, they start drinking. They start to experience sensorily what's happening. Jesus, I'm telling you, is thinking about the big wedding. Isaiah 25. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all people a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well-refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil spread over the nations. He will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. The reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We've waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. He wants us to experience the goodness of tasting God, of enjoying the Lord. That's why his first miracle was to cheer everybody up, get them laughing. Don't get upset, this is a wedding. Number three, how of course does Jesus bring joy? That's the million dollar question. How does he bring joy? Jesus was going to redeem a wedding from disaster to joy by filling up jars used for washing yourself. That's what he's going to do. Old Testament Judaism showed us through religious rites and rules that nobody's holy and righteous enough to attain the presence of God. So what you had to do was there were a number of things. You had to wash your feet, your hands, your face. You had to do a whole lot of stuff to declare yourself ceremonially unclean. And our God, being who our God is, goes to the ceremonial washing jars. And says, fill those things with water. If the guests had known 
That's where their water was coming from. They would have had what we call apoplexy. So Jesus goes to the servants. He says, those jars there, fill them up quickly. So they fill them up to the brim. He doesn't go, kill you here, kill your dad. Jesus just says, <laughs> Jesus just says, take some of that water quick. Go give it to the master of the feast. Those servants must have been freaking out. Yeah. And he takes a sip and whoo-hoo. You see, what Jesus was going to show us was that he was going to accomplish what all the ceremonial washing in the whole world could never accomplish. He was going to show us that he turns an object lesson, a useless object lesson, he himself can turn into life. But it's interesting. His mom says to him, they run out of wine. Jesus looks at her and he says, woman, my time has not come. Because now you're all thinking, I can't wait for later when she tells me I need a drink. Woman, what has this to do with me? My time has not yet come. Jesus was kind. We know that. Even on the cross, he didn't turn. Didn't get angry. Didn't react. Father, forgive them. Sorted out relationships with his mom and John and made sure everyone's there. On the cross, he's taking care of everybody else. But in this instance, at the beginning of his ministry, the Greek word says he, he, he got sharp with her. What's going on here? Why does Jesus get a little bit angry here? Because his time hasn't come. What time hasn't come? You see, he's not ready to die yet. The symbolism of Jesus is I'm turning water into wine. Why wine? Because we know because we break bread and take communion together that wine is a symbol of his blood. So he is saying, I'm going to wash you. I'm going to bring joy to a party. But the only way I can bring joy is through the shedding of my blood. Brimful. I'm going to give you everything you need through the shedding of my blood. You will have joy through my suffering. That's where joy comes from. Joy comes from the price Jesus paid. And it's you and I fully appreciating and fully appropriating the blood of Jesus that causes joy to flow. That's why I said you can have Christmas where you don't have everything you need. You don't have all the loved ones you need. You don't have everything around the way you want. But you have a joy that cannot be taken or stolen because your joy is not in this. Your joy is in what you've received. But if you don't think on it, you'll lose it. Yes? Because where you think, that's where your feelings go. And every one of us in this room have got things we can think about to make us unhappy or upset or depressed or lonely. Everyone in this room. And so Jesus is saying, woman, you need to understand, this is going to cost me for you to have joy. You want your joy restored in a moment. Think of what this cost Jesus. And then think he did it for you that the Father can rejoice over you. I hope you're listening. Fourthly, not only does he show us how he brings us joy, but he reveals himself to us as the bridegroom. In the Old Testament, God showed he doesn't only want to be a master or a king, he wants to be a groom relating to his bride. He wants a love relationship with us, similar to that with intimacy of a man and a woman. And the whole of Israel knew that they were the bride and God was the bridegroom. And then Jesus does this massive thing in Luke chapter 5, 33. They said to him, the disciples of John fast often and offer prayers. So do the disciples of the Pharisees, yours eat and drink. Jesus said to them, can you make wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? It was a shocking statement. He was equating himself with the Father in heaven. John picks this up in the book of Revelation, verse, chapter 21, verse 2. And I saw the holy city. New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning or crying or pain anymore for the former things have passed away. In chapter 19, verse 9, few chap two chapters before, the angel said, Write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Jesus is saying, I am a groom and I am waiting for this. I'm actually the bridegroom. I will supply the wine. I will supply the joy. I will provide the environment. I will bring you all together. And then I'm going to be the one who celebrates you. It's all about me. That's what he's saying. 
We all look forward to weddings, don't we? We love weddings. Have you ever seen they have those moments which all the single people, well, most of the single people cringe at when they throw the garter and the flowers? All the single people come to the middle of the dance floor and you're not married and you feel like you're such a space cadet because you've got to go stand there for your 568th wedding where you're still not married and you're like 58. And you stand there thinking, oh. And they're going to throw a bouquet and they throw flowers and the symbolism is that they're going to hook up and who knows what it all means. But what do single people think when they go to a wedding? I'll tell you. Most often, a single person looks and they think, I wonder what my own wedding is going to be like. I wonder what my wedding is going to be like. And they look and they observe and they check. Jesus is attending a wedding, thinking ahead to his own wedding. Looking ahead, saying, I know what it's going to be like when I'm the groom. That bride's going to come and I'm going to wash her. I'm going to make her perfect. I'm going to wipe the, wipe the tears away from her death, sighing sorrow. I'm going to clean her. I'm going to look after her. I'm going to, I'm going to invest myself fully into her. I'm going to be the best bridegroom there ever, ever was. All this we celebrate because a child was born. Last thing, how does Jesus bring us joy? How? How does he do it? Practical terms. You want to walk out of here today saying, all right, I want to be joyful. I want to be someone who doesn't have my joy stolen. I want to walk in joy. What do you do? Number one. Joy is an attitude of choice. James chapter 1 verse 2 tells us that life is filled with trial, temptation, sickness, disease, all of that. And we're to possess a spirit of joy and perseverance as we face the trials of life. Friends, I need to say this very clearly. Joy is an attitude. In the same way as being miserable and sulking is an attitude, so is joy. No one in this church knows what I'm talking about. But sometimes you can be in a situation where you're sulking at home. And it takes a lot of effort to sulk and ignore the other person and walk around with death and despair all over you. It takes effort. I don't know. I read about this in a book somewhere. <laughs> and it takes a lot of effort and you've got to try it. I'm telling you, if you put as much effort into being joyful as you did into being miserable, your world would change. You need to understand joy is a choice. You pick it up. You choose to think about not you and your little circumstances, about Him. It's a choice. That's number one. Joy is an attitude of choice. Number two. So number one, you choose it. Choose joy. Choose how you're going to respond. Number two. Be aware of the joy robbers. Because joy is robbed through the temptations of this world. That's how joy is robbed. Be aware of the things that you know trip you up. Be aware of them and choose not to go down that road. If Christmas season is coming and you don't have a lot of bucks, settle it in the beginning. We don't have a lot. Look at the things you can do without money. Look to the Lord and say, Lord, how do we engage one another? How do, we, how do I get my joy full? I can't look at people who have what I don't have. Because there's always people who have what you don't have. And by the way, as you've just looked at the Steinhoff thing, you can have as much money as you want. It can go in a day. About 120 billion can go in a day. If you know the triggers that upset you, make a decision. I'm not going to allow a joy robber near me. I'm choosing. I don't want it to. Because when you're miserable, that's a choice. So choose. Choose. Not only do you choose joy, you now choose to ignore the joy robbers. Number three, fill up your joy tank. Your joy has to be guarded. Maintain your access to God. Maintain your joy of eternal life, your faith in Christ, your fellowship with God, your fellowship with each other. Find the things that fill your joy tank, spiritually and in the natural. Turn things around. Enjoy what you've been given. How many of us we couldn't wait for a baby to be born? Then it is, and the thing doesn't stop crying. And I mean the wife. I'm joking. I mean the baby. And that very thing you wanted is the thing that upsets you and causes you not to sleep. You asked for it. Thank God for this little joy. 
Because the time may well come when you're old and infirm. And the way you held this child is the way that child's going to hold you. I couldn't wait for school holidays because I don't have to get up so early and fight the traffic on Louis Buerta. Now it's holidays and I've got three kids and a cousin. I've got four of them at home. I can't wait for school. <laughs> Never going to be happy. So thank the Lord for these little thugs. Isn't it? Six o'clock this morning. I'm getting ready for you. I'm getting ready. Luke and Levi are around with bows and arrows. They're real bows and arrows. With the sharp ends. In my house. What are you doing? No, we're playing. I said, if that arrow goes, huh, get out. Where the dogs are, outside. Shoot there. <laughs> Seriously, they've got big targets. It's big arrows. Someone in this church gave it to them. Boop, and they, you can kill things, man. They're running around in my house. Lord, thank you for my kids. <laughs> Fill your joy tank. There's my pension. Running around, playing. Number four, set the tone. Set the tone. Set the tone. You see, when Jesus was about, about to bring joy to a feast, all he told the disciples, to, uh, the, the servants to do, is, he said, go over there, fill up with water, walk to there, give it to the master of the feast. As he drinks it, they didn't know what's going to happen. All they had to do was serve. All they had to do was listen. All they had to do was obey. It's up to Jesus to make the miracle happen. You need joy in your life. Just obey. Just do. Just serve. Jesus says, just do what I tell you. Take a cup, fill a pitcher with water, give the water out, and the water turns into wine by my hand, not yours. You can't change yourself. January 1, a whole lot of you is going to make New Year resolutions that you'll break by January 3. A whole lot of you but you feel good for a day. The point is, Jesus says, just obey me. Set the tone. Serve those around you. Just serve. Serve anybody you can find. Serve them. And watch me do miracles of joy through your serving. And last one, let joy flow. Let joy flow. The Bible says streams of living water will flow from within us. As excited as you are about Jesus, share it. Communicate it. Live it. Show you're excited. Show you're at a feast, you've been drinking wine, and it's time to party. Demonstrate that Christ has filled you. These people feasted under Roman occupation with nothing. They were heavily taxed to pay for Rome's wars in other places. These people were poor, yet they were able to feast fully because of the presence of the wine. You can feast in Jesus without having stuff. And like the angels, and I'll probably preach this on Christmas morning, the angels descended and said, peace and joy on earth to all people. It is the message of Jesus through people intoxicated with the wine of joy, the presence of Jesus. Stand with me, please.